This is Ham Radio Now, the most important amateur radio program on the internet. And I don't care what those guys say in the YouTube comments. That's what it is. And this is episode 381. Digital Voice for Amateur Radio 2008. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Okay, I hear you say 2008. Isn't that like 10 years ago? This is 2018. Yes. Well, before there was Ham Radio Now, there was ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News, the documentary production unit that I started when I was making DVDs before I discovered, I guess before I discovered YouTube, or at least before I could use it effectively. And I made a whole bunch of programs. I made some forums and stuff from Dayton. Um, but I made three serious documentary programs um, back, in, back in those days. Somewhere between 2004 and when I started this in 2012. Uh, two of them are on Ham Radio Now uh, as episodes. Um, episode 79 has got one of the programs called The Last Big Field Day. And um, episode 134 has uh, the second documentary called uh, ARDF, Amateur Radio Direction Finding or, or Fox Hunting. And um, I made a third one probably the most epic, the biggest production of all. And so far, it hasn't been put on the internet for you to consume. And for a while, I didn't want to put it on the internet because it was getting old. It was getting out of date. It was on digital voice for amateur radio. It was getting kind of out of date. And uh, I, I didn't think it, it would be steering people the wrong direction, understanding things wrong. Well, enough time has passed. Now it is the 10th anniversary of producing that back in 2008, that it is a historical document, a historical program, not historical, not hysterical. Maybe, maybe it was both. Uh, I made it on DVD. I sold about 325 of them or so. Mm, not nearly what I hoped to, but, it, you know, not bad, I suppose. Uh, I don't even have any of the original DVDs left. I, I shipped them all out. Uh, but this is what the uh, title uh, of the uh, the disc looked like. Um, th what the cover of the of the DVD looked like. So that's if 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 you're one of those people that bought one, you have a historical item that I don't even have anymore. So. Um, is something that I thought you know, now it has got some history to it. This is, I think, the only uh, video program that anybody's ever made that delves into the origins of digital voice, both on HF and on uh, VHF, UHF, for, uh, for amateur radio. And I thought, well, uh, before I leave this ham radio now thing entirely, and as you know, I'm on my way out, handing things over to David Goldenberg, W0DHG, before I leave entirely, I better get this online, and uh, for those of you that are fairly new to digital voice, you can see something of where things started. So this is the uh, the program. Well, this is this is me. Let me give you a split screen of me and me, um, about ten years apart. Pretty <laughs> pretty cool. A little bit more hair on top of my head then. Uh, so. I, I made the program in um, three parts. I did an introduction, and then I did the HF stuff, and I did the uh, the VHF stuff as separate programs on the DVD. I'm just going to run them all together now for you. And you have control. You've got the pause button and the fast forward and all that. You can pick whatever you want. But they were designed to be um, the introduction and then then either one of these separate programs worked out to be about as much as you'd want to play in a ham radio club meeting. These were sort of designed to be programs at ham radio clubs. So the first month you would play one of them. And then the second month, if everybody liked the first one, play the other one. Or if everybody wanted to sit there and watch the second half, you could do it in one night, but it would take you about 90 minutes. That's what you're in for now, depending on how long you want to sit in front of the tube. Uh, I, I think that's, all I've got to tell you in, in advance. Well, I took two big trips to, uh, to put this program together. I took a trip that went uh, to Chicago and St. Louis. 
and I took a trip that went to Alabama and then finally out to Dallas. So the, like I said, this was a pretty epic production. It was pretty expensive to do with all that traveling. And uh, it, it earned back uh, about what it cost me to make. Once again, one of those, I don't make any money off of this in terms of uh, profit that, you know, paid its expenses. So um, tell you what, let's, uh, let me rewind this uh, back to the beginning yeah, and uh, quiet. And uh, if I can, there we go. Rewind it back to the beginning and uh, let's uh, get started with Digital Voice for Amateur Radio. Hello and welcome to another edition of Amateur Radio Video News. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. And in this program, we're going to take a look at digital voice for amateur radio. It's all very new and cutting edge. But before we get into the ham radio part, I want to take a step back and look at the big picture. Uh, no, not you. Come on back here. I want to look at some of the stuff that I've collected over the years for digital communications. Uh, I think we start with the Humble CD, developed back in the 1980s. Got my first digital cell phone, my second digital cell phone, my third digital cell phone. I think I'm now on my fourth digital cell phone. Probably have too many of those. I've got a cordless phone. It's digital. It's also spread spectrum. I've got a uh, local area network for the computer. That's digital. I've got a scanner that is also able to pick up the digital police communications that we have in this area. And I've got my little video camera. It's also digital. And that reminds me, my main camera that we're shooting this program with is also digital. And that's my lovely wife, Cindy. Say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. So why is all this stuff digital? Well, this is truly a case where one picture could be worth a thousand words. Uh, yeah, now it's time. This little TV set is also digital. And well, until February 2009, it'll play analog too. The uh, rabbit ears on top, are not just to make it look retro, they're to help me pick up an over-the-air TV signal to give you a demonstration of the difference between analog and digital. As you can see, it's pretty noisy, so let me switch to the digital signal. And I think you can see the difference. Not just high definition, but no noise, no ghosts. The simple point is that you can do a lot with digital signals that are difficult or impossible to do with analog signals. And you can do them in the same or less bandwidth. This high definition picture fits in the same six megahertz TV channel as an analog signal. And there's room left over for another standard definition picture and even another standard definition picture. And I'll switch back to my logo before I get in any copyright trouble here. Now, what about ham radio? Well, we've got packet that goes back into the 1980s. Not with this TNC, but we had it. We have a bunch of digital modes on HF. And if you count teletype, it goes back into the 1950s. I'd show you my Model 19, but I think my dad threw it away when I went to college in 1970. These days, teletype and the other digital modes on HF are done on a computer. We've got the super narrow modes like PSK31 that we use this rig blaster for. But all of those modes are text-based. What about voice? We still do a lot more talking than anything else. Well, a lot of rigs have DSP, that's digital signal processing, in their IF and audio sections for voice and other modes, mostly to help clean up noise. But until recently, there hasn't been any digital voice sent over the air. That's changing. The first modes for digital voice are here now. And I wonder, how much do hams know about them? I asked that question at a local ham fest. Now, I really don't know that much about uh, digital voice at this time, but I will look into it. I know D-Star exists. I've been uh, seeing a few advertisements for new radios out. I try to read it when it comes out in the magazines and understand it, but I'm not doing a good job. It's going to take up more bandwidth. It's noisy. Nobody can understand it. It's just more QRM on the band. That's going to be the end to the uh, go online and find uh, build yourself a two meter radio kit. Uh, I've done some research on digital voice, but I uh, really haven't gotten into it yet. Oh boy, I don't know a whole lot about it. I know a good bit from the cellular telephone industry too, because we've been using digital voice for a good while now. Right now, I had to see it and know more about it before I really gave an informed opinion. The question is, how many people are using it, and um, what does it cost to get into? It seems to be the oncoming thing for ham radio as well as other forms of communication. And I think it's a good idea. And I think it's expensive right now. It is the future. The future? Well, I guess we better get to know it.
At least for now, there are some significant differences in the way digital voice is being developed for HF and our VHF UHF bands, so we're going to look at each one separately. The HF part of the program will take about 25 minutes, the VHF part about 35 minutes. So if you're watching this at a club meeting, you might not want to watch the whole thing in one night. I'm going to send you back to the menu so you can choose which one you want to see. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to send you back to me and uh, we will watch the, uh, the HF program. My first peek at HF Digital Voice came at the Dayton Hamvention in 2005 at the AOR booth. Jeff Reinhardt, AA6JR, was giving demonstrations of the ARD 9800 and 9000 fast modems, devices that connect simply to the microphone input and speaker output of an HF radio to create a digital signal. Okay, this is analog, analog, one, two, three, four, five, we're at 14, two, three, six, I'm 20 meters, can you hear me okay? This is digital FSB, one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one, digital five band, one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. There is a little latency, there's about a second delay between my words and what you hear, but uh, when you're on the radio, nobody would know that. I noticed when it went to digital, nobody had to adjust any equipment, the modem automatically recognizes the digital signal, and uh, lets the analog pass through as well. So it's not, a, not an operator-intensive unit. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Now about the six, Juliet Romeo. Okay, interesting. I wasn't expecting that delay. Jeff explained that when you push the transmit button, the modem has to spend about a second sending those synchronizing tones, and it buffers your speech until those are done. But here's the $64 question. Why do digital? In a forum at the 2007 Hamvention, Jeff explained. In clarity. Uh, we can offer you crystal clear audio. You don't have to constantly be tweaking the connections or the settings on your radio to do this. And there's no background noises or static crashes that you're going to hear in that audio. And he played a short recorded example that the audience found stunning. Long to me. So let's give a listen and see if we can hear it here. K0 PFX 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. One, two, three, four, five, K zero, PFX. Now, did you hear the background noise come right back up on that? He also admitted a reality of digital HF at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. And digital needs signal, S5 or better. Now, I want you folks to burn this one into your head today, okay? There's two rules that I come away with in this world. Digital needs signal and ice cream melts, okay? Those two don't ever change. So repeat to yourself in your head, ice cream melts, digital needs signal, okay? That's just, it doesn't matter which digital mode that you're in, it needs signal. And we Actually, it's only the high frequency digital voice modes that need a fairly strong signal. The VHF, UHF modes that we'll look at later work down to near the noise level. By the way, the voice you heard booming through in the demo that Jeff played was Mel Witten, K0PFX. Mel is an early adopter and advocate for digital voice in all its forms. Again, most of us run relatively low power. Uh, if you run about 25 to 30 watts, your peaks will hit, uh, you know, in the 80 to 90 watt range. That's about all the power you need to run. I visited Mel at his home in St. Louis to see HF Digital Voice in action. Mel runs digital voice nets each weekend on 20 meters, first for the AOR system, and then for a couple of systems based on your computer sound card. Before we go any farther, let's just listen to some of the AOR net. And as you watch this, keep in mind what Jeff Reinhardt said about digital voice needing a lot of signal. Yeah, uh, the day I came to St. Louis, up, uh, propagation wasn't very good. We're going to see uh, HF digital voice at its worst, not its best. Uh, do we have any further check-ins with the AOR digital voice net K0 PFX? K4RP in Brooksville, Florida. Oh, you're doing great. Uh, Propagation is good this week, anyway. Uh, I got a good copy on Jason, and uh, I had to turn the beam for uh, Jerry in one FFX, but uh, it's funny. <laughs> I guess uh, Jason's got a bit more power, evidently. It hasn't changed on this end. We're running a nominal. Uh, about 200 right now. We uh, figured that uh, there is some uh, uh, slow QSP there that uh, has taken us out once in a while, so I thought I'd come up to 
a little bit more power. Uh, the five land, I think it was a five land station in there. Uh, this is K0PFX. K0PFX, this is November 5, Bravo Zulu Alpha. My name is Wayne. I'm in Paducah, Kentucky. You're loud and clear on this end. Back to you. November 8, Golf United, NHGU. Name here is Bob Navalasher Bravo, located up here in Plain City, Ohio, near Columbus, Ohio. This is the first time I've ever used this thing since I um, bought it over at the Newton Hamvention, so I'm hoping you guys will let me know if I'm sounding okay. Yeah, connect control from November 8, Golf United. You can hear some artifacts, but those signals aren't too bad. I'll confess that I picked some of the better transmissions for those examples. But here's what it sounds like when a signal doesn't quite make it. Uh, K4RT and K0PFX. K0, K4RT and return. Yeah, no problem. You're uh, just uh, 10 over. Yeah, he's... Yeah, it's, uh, it's, real, it's wild out here, I tell you. <laughs> All these stations that were talking uh, 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 they were 40 over. <laughs> now he should sink. Huh? It's not doing it today. There he sinks back up automatically. But it was a lot of fun. Our <laughs> conditions can go up and down. We've been through that before. And, but uh, overall, it's still still a very good mode. So that's what digital voice sounds like, using the AOR fast modem. I asked Mel to explain a little bit more about them. This is the 9800. This was the first one uh, that AOR came out with uh, a few years ago. It has its own microphone, which uh, works quite well. Uh, even W2IHY said it had good audio, so <laughs> I was quite surprised with that. But the microphone plugs right uh, directly into the modem, and the output of this is cabled uh, to the input of the radio. And that's, that's all the connections you need, other than the encoded uh, data is uh, connected from your speaker uh, to the input of the uh, AOR. Most of the time, it's just plug and play. Turn up your audio until the LED quits blinking here and uh, you're ready to uh, decode. And uh, for transmit, it's just a matter of uh, squeezing the microphone. It sends out a uh, sync tone, and the other end receives a sync tone, and you're immediately on uh, decoding uh, digital voice. Uh, it has a nice little program, something similar to Qt FTP, which allow you to do file transfers, and those transfers can be even done uh, unattended. It also has a uh, digital picture capability. You can plug in a camera in it or any uh, device that has NTSC input. Uh, push this button here and it will capture the picture. Push the button again and it transmits the picture. So it really simplifies uh, a slow scan and it's a progressive slow scan uh, very similar to the early uh, analog slow scan. So you see the picture uh, as it's being done. The AOR 9000 is just a uh, a modem for digital voice uh, only, and it's uh, much lower cost, smaller, and it can even be uh, battery operated as a uh, very low power uh, modem. This is the 9000 is a few hundred dollars, battery. the 9800 a little bit more. But if you have a computer with a sound card in the shack, there are some free programs that let you get on digital voice for almost no extra cost. The first one Mel demonstrated is WinDRM, a ham radio version of Digital Radio Mondial, written by Sesco, HB9TLK. And as you watch this demonstration, let me point out that Mel is operating one of the Flex series of radios. It uses a computer interface, not a control panel, so that might make things a little confusing. This screen is the Flex radio control. This screen is the WinDRM control panel. Okay, Mel. K0PFX, k 4 you're right on 14 on SNR, and uh, right towards the end there, you're nine. Uh, great audio. 
the road's been awful dry. Most most of the state has been getting sporadic showers the last uh, couple of, last past week, I guess. But uh, it's all been in the afternoons. The low pressure areas over the state right now is similar to the ones over uh, uh, in the Texas area is causing all the problems. But ours is uh, most of it's in the south. We'll get out our uh, expensive microphone. Uh, this is K0, Peter. Before we ask Mel to explain what we're seeing, let's listen to a few more voices on WinDRM as he calls the Saturday afternoon net. You'll note that Mel has switched computers and radios. I think he's just trying to show off. And if I had a shack like this, I would too. Uh, please call now, over. K0, PFX to the boys net. This is AG1V. You can see a big difference well, in mics. Well, your signal was a heck of a lot. It was yesterday, Mel. You're running. Well, he's got the show is, uh, dropouts. Around 12 to 13. No trouble copy, 100% uh -huh. copy today. PFX for a J8. Okay, fine, uh, Mel. I uh, had some of my gains down a little low there. You may have said something earlier, but in any event, you have here this afternoon longer uh, than usual, and uh, I haven't been around too much between uh, some travels this summer and just uh, other summer-type things. Um, haven't been on the radio very much, but wanted to uh, make an effort to uh, get in here today to uh, participate in this. N1FFX, uh, how are you doing with us, Jerry? Not very strong, though. He's really... Uh, we're not doing too bad over here. Uh, I just hope you can hear my signal the way things have been here today. Boy. Yeah, if I can get through it all, that's a... Yeah, we've got some dropouts. Not, not much uh, uh, change here from, uh, from the AOR net there. Uh, had a pretty good conversation with uh, Jason. I hadn't talked to him in a while, of course, because he's been with uh, a lot of summer stuff. And uh, oh, just PFX is K U T K. Something just fine. Uh, 19, 18 to 19 uh, signal to noise ratio. 100% uh, copy. I'm having to be one dropout in all of your transmissions. Sounding really good. To Today, the wind DRM signals are sounding better than the AOR signals, but there's still some dropouts, and that's the nature of digital. Most of the time, the signal is either there or it's not. Uh, thanks for checking in today, and uh, glad to have you with us. Uh, now, let's have Mel explain how this stuff is hooked up. The equipment chain you need, the hardware you'd need for uh, digital voice is uh, actually quite simple. Uh, it, works, it works best with two sound cards. It can be done with one. But uh, what we found uh, early on was uh, using a USB sound card, which uh, here's one here. Uh, actually, that's the entire card right there. Uh, uh, audio out, audio in. You plug your uh, typical PC microphone in that maybe cost you two or three bucks and plug your uh, speaker system here and your uh, encoded and decoded audio is out of this card right here. And it's very easy to use it. Uh, here we have an example where I've got um, this uh, black line goes back to my speaker systems here. And uh, here is my microphone here. I found the Radio Shack and it, uh, it works quite well. It has good audio response. Now the other alternative, if you're using something for Skype or voice over IP applications, is a headset. And this one's from Logitech. It works quite well. You can see it's plugged in uh, over here on this computer. I'm, I'm basically using one computer for HF and the other one for VHF. It just plugs in. And when it's plugged in, uh, WinDRM automatically sees that as a sound card and then you uh, select it in WinDRM. So the, uh, the setup uh, is fairly uh, easy t uh, to do. The interface to the indigenous card does go through a uh, rig blaster or equivalent interface so that we make sure that uh, we avoid any ground loops, any noise pickup. And this is typically used for Digi DigiPan, for example. If you're set up for DigiPan, a very popular digital program, then all you need is a little second sound card, 
or a headset, and plug those in, and uh, load the program, set your levels, and uh, you're ready to go on uh, digital voice. Again, the HF rig can be, uh, the ICOM 706 is a very popular radio. Its bandpass is great. Uh, you need 2.5 kilohertz. Uh, and you, the carriers, there's uh, up to 55 carriers that carry this uh, audio at a very slow baud rate, and that's why it works so well on HF. And as a result, the bandwidth uh, needs to be 2.5 and a nice and flat, no equalization and no compression and so forth. Yeah, Jerry, uh, N1FFX, K0PFX. Digital uh, voice is a work in progress, you, uh, it probably always will be, with the and, goals uh, of better weak signal performance while maintaining degree, good audio. So. Sesco's yeah, next program robust. is called DRMDV. Uh, it loses a, a little voice quality, in, uh, but it works closer to the, the noise voice, level. A little bit more raspy on the highs, I think. So um, back to you and see how you're copying, Jerry. N1FFX, Sterling Mass, this is K0PFX. Okay, Mel, yeah, I can understand if you have to swap cables around there and stuff. Yeah, we're running version 1.43R, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, so, um, I guess that's the latest one out there, the R version. <laughs> the whole key to this is this signal-to-noise uh, ratio over here. Um, a little bit of the audio. 14 is really good. Okay, uh, very good. It'll work uh, around well, 6 to 7. Um, I don't know how much of my uh, you can see here the there, um, but, there's uh, some multipath what they call notches in the waterfall. I, I and there he had a dropout. Oh, I must have doubled with you somewhat there. Uh, K zero PFX. This is in one FFX. Very good. Uh, Gary wants to see some sideband so we can get some comparison. So uh, if you can come back to me in sideband and I'll switch over and uh, do the same here. Uh, uh, please go to sideband. K0, PFX, over. Turn the mute uh, off. Swap uh, my cable here. here. Uh, uh, but um, uh, using the uh, regular Yezu mic here now, I would like to at uh, well, some point maybe uh, get something that's only about six inches long and uh, <laughs> uh, about 20 feet there. Uh, K0, PFX, and when this affects, go ahead. Uh, hopefully the signal's come back up again here. Um, uh, I won't hold it too long here in case it hasn't. Although with this mode, uh, there is one nice thing. If you drop sync, it will come back again when the signal comes up, uh, unlike uh, uh, some other modes. Uh, <laughs> oh, PFX, this is in one FFX. Now, let me run through a few more quick points about HF Digital Voice. The first is latency, which affects turnaround time. I've edited this video so that things happen fairly quickly, but in real time, it takes a second or three to start up and stop a digital voice transmission. Well, back to you and see, uh, see how our signals are holding up down there in Florida. K4RTN, this is K0PFX St. Louis. The AOR system is faster than WinDRM, but fast push-to-talk and Vox aren't really practical yet. Getting hams to slow down can be a challenge. I uh, see he's he's sending his uh, ID right here in the waterfall and a lot of times we do that so other people can tell that you know we're in there and who, who okay, it is. Mal. Okay, you're okay. Thanks. Take more, Jen. Next is the potential need for channelization. You can't overlap digital voice signals the way you can with sideband. Digital voice doesn't tolerate interference very well from analog signals or other digital signals. A competing signal can make your receiver just go dead. He's been hit by that carrier really bad. So if you had several digital voice conversations going on at once, they need to be spread out carefully across the band, maybe by dedicating channels the way we do on VHF FM. Today, there's only one channel in use, 14236, just above the analog slow scan signals on 14230 and the digital slow scan on 14233. And finally, there's a problem with digital voice signals not being recognized by sideband operators. Yeah, this is what it sounds like if you're uh, tuning across with a uh, analog radio. Since many hams have never heard digital voice, many have not even heard of digital voice, they can start operating on a busy frequency without realizing it. Getting their attention can be difficult. 
Yeah, they will not acknowledge the fact that the frequency is in use there, Mel. Uh, I know I'm putting up well, frequency. Well, I'm not sure if we're still bothering somebody. Um, it's confusing here. From 236 to 238 to Decimal 5, there doesn't seem to be much room. Uh, are we still in, uh, invading another QSO place, go ahead? Uh, Roger, we're running a digital voice, digital voice net here. Uh, digital voice net on 14236, which is digital. 233 and 230, they're all digital. And you're right on top of us today. <laughs> K410, Brooksville, Florida. Okay, uh, Shrem, move back to 238, decimal 5, and we'll play that way for some of you guys, go ahead. <laughs> I said earlier that digital voice is a work in progress. I visited Mel in the summer of 2007. In December, Sesco released yet another digital voice program called FDM-DV. It uses less than half the bandwidth of WinDRM, works with weaker signals than DRM-DV, tolerates interference a little better, synchronizes instantly so there's little delay in stopping and starting, and still sounds pretty good. Mel sent me this sample. Zero PFX AC5 IU. Yeah, there was something to do with emergencies uh, new and uh, some rehashes out there. And I looked at it and played with it. And if I have too much trouble downloading, I, I let it go for a while and come back. And I figured one of them out. I, I just had to have two of my programs that Come on, first thing. So, Mel, do you think digital voice will take over from single sideband anytime soon? As uh, um, far as uh, completely uh, replacing sideband, no, I don't, I don't see that in uh, anywhere in the near future. Uh, we may see uh, more, uh, a lot more digital voice once people experience it. Uh, but right now, uh, just getting the word out as to what it is and how well it works and getting people to use it. Uh, then we'll see more users. But uh, right now, uh, you know, we're pretty well embedded in sideband because of its uh, its robustness, especially for uh, uh, DX stations and the, you know, the, and the way they operate. Uh, digital voice probably uh, won't be their cup of tea for a while. Well, my crystal ball is cloudy. I guess I don't see digital voice becoming mainstream until it's built into our radios. But then the radios would have to be upgradable and handle multiple formats because. Things keep changing. I also think it would be better if the radios were optimized for digital voice instead of plugging into the microphone and speaker connectors. And like Mel said, I'm not sure how DX and contests would work, but I suppose we'll see. I do think that the image modes and the text modes would be useful for public service and for emergencies. Well, I'm gonna send you back to the DVD menu now. You can move on to see the VHF program, or if you're done, I'll just say thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Uh, my crystal ball was cloudy back then. Still cloudy. But I did get a few things right. Uh, I thought that digital voice on HF would work better if it was built into radios. And so far, it has been built into one series of radios. The uh, Flex 6000 series has what uh, became of the, um, the digital voice system we looked at there uh, became FreeDV. Codec 2 was developed, and, and now you can get that uh, added to your uh, Flex 6000 series radio. Nobody else has picked that up yet. Um, and digital voice on HF has never really become that much of a thing. It's still out there. People are still using it, but it has yet to really catch fire. What has caught on, I don't know if we could say fire yet, but what has caught on and become quite a thing is the digital voice modes on VHF and UHF. And so let's take a look at the VHF part of the program. Welcome back to ARVN's program on digital voice for amateur radio. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. In the first part of the program, we looked at the new HF digital voice modes. In this part, we'll look at VHF and UHF. Now, if digital voice for HF is not quite ready for prime time, it's a different story on VHF and above. Digital television, cell phones, and two-way radios have all been around for more than a decade. They're proven technology. Ham radio's just a little late to the party. Well, there's some good reasons for that. We've got a huge infrastructure of FM analog repeaters, and they work pretty well. I mean, after all, FM is supposed to be noise-free and high fidelity and all that, although sometimes it isn't. 
But I think a bigger reason is we have to pay for all this stuff ourselves. No fat corporate budgets to fund a transition and buy us all new gear. Still, we have gotten started. Alinco was actually first to market with amateur radio FM transceivers that could also do digital. That was around 2001, but they didn't work through repeaters, and without a repeater infrastructure, interest was limited. When commercial equipment using the APCO 25 digital system became available on the surplus market, hams in several areas of the country put up P25 repeaters. Gee, uh, am I making it through the repeater now? There we go. We'll take a closer look at that later in the program. But the big news in amateur radio digital voice on VHF and UHF is the D-Star system. D-Star had been incubating in Japan since the turn of the century. It first appeared in America in 2002, and unlike Alinco, it came as a complete system. A radio, a repeater, and an internet connection called a gateway but it was only for the 1200 megahertz band, a band most of us have never considered using, so again, interest was limited. In 2005, ICOM, the only manufacturer making D-Star equipment so far, expanded the product line into the two meter and 70 centimeter bands with handheld, mobile, and dual band radios and repeaters ready to go. And by the Dayton Hamvention in May 2006, some of the earliest of early adopters had had repeaters on the air long enough that they had worked out most of the bugs and they were ready to tell the world. And the world was ready to listen. Hams packed a forum at a downtown Dayton hotel as the guys from the Texas Interconnect team in Dallas, the first hams to put D-Star on the air in the U.S. outside of ICOM's headquarters, described their adventure. I wish I could play it for you, but I only shot still pictures. By October 2006, though, there was enough interest to bring about 150 hams, many of them brand new D-Star repeater owners, from across the country to Huntsville, Alabama for a weekend of in-depth seminars. Okay, welcome everyone to the D-Star training seminar in Huntsville. It seems that uh, running a D-Star repeater have, uh, is fairly complex and a little education is required. The other thing to remember is we talk about the repeater syncing up with the trust server and every night. Every gateway syncs up with every other gateway. Well, bless these guys, but this video isn't so much about them. It's more about you, the potential D-Star user, if not today. I've done some research on digital voice, but I uh, really haven't gotten into it yet. Well, maybe someday. Mm, maybe. It's, I think maybe just a big fan going through. <laughs> okay, Curtis, let's see what's in it for you. To find out, I took a road trip and visited some of the people who put up D-Star repeaters. The guys in Dallas, Alabama, Chicago, and St. Louis. It's going to be a while before they get up. Now, right before now. I yap anymore, let's sit back and listen to some D-Star in operation. Doing fine, just uh, playing with the uh, 91 AD a little bit and uh, trying to decipher some of the messages as they scroll across the bottom of the screen. Well, how are you coming with that project? Not making a lot of progress. I need to. Uh, I need to get serious about it and work on it a little bit harder. This is too nice a day to be inside, though. I would agree with that. It is uh, too nice a day, and I'll probably wrap this up pretty quick. But uh, go outside, and enjoy the the nice, uh, nice spring day. What you can probably already tell is that D-Star sounds a lot like FM. What sets it apart is what's missing. There's no noise, no mobile flutter or picket fencing. Like its high-frequency cousins, D-Star Digital Voice is generally rock solid or it's gone. Yeah, a few warm days like this and uh, some of the grasses will start budding out again and that'll be pretty nice the next few weeks. There are some other things you don't hear. No repeater hang time, no repeater IDs or announcements, and no auto patch. Those elements that we're so used to in the analog repeater world are missing in D-Star only because ICOM chose not to include them in its current generation of controllers. My guess is that they'll be back if we want them. Now you get a chance to see those. I get a chance to look at the one up here that we all pull our water out of. The beep you hear at the end of some transmissions isn't a repeater courtesy tone. That's missing from the controllers too. It's actually generated by the user's receiver, and you can turn it off if you want to. And then uh, some of the lakes in East Texas that I'm familiar with, they're full again. 
So what do you think about the D-Star sound? I've heard many hams describe it as good, but a little robotic or metallic, not quite as natural as analog FM. I find myself wishing that it were a little better, but I get used to it. I certainly prefer it to a noisy analog signal. Well, all these lakes in North Texas did a pretty good job of keeping us uh, supplied with water when well, the population was about uh, half of what it is now, but uh, I think the population has uh, overrun the capacity of the lakes to provide the kind of water we need. We're riding with Jim McClellan, N5MIJ, hey, and Fred Varian, WD5ERD. Jim's the one doing the talking, and we'll see more than the backs of their heads in a minute. We're on our way to downtown Dallas to meet Bill Moore and 5ZPR. Yeah, Bill. I'm uh, in the parking lot. Together, they are the Texas Interconnect team, and we're going to take a look at the D-Star system they built. It's on top of one of these downtown skyscrapers. Okay, let me give you a quick overview of the D-Star repeater system here at the Texas Interconnect team. We start with power supply for DC, circuit breakers, power amplifiers, two meter repeater, 440 repeater, 23 centimeter data radio, 23 centimeter voice repeater, the controller with an ethernet connection back into the rest of the system, then duplexers. Installing the basic voice repeater system is no different than installing an FM voice repeater system. It's all the same hardware, hooks up all the same way. This is something that doesn't exist in the analog system. This is all the computer equipment that we use for the gateway, the internet connection, and a local server for web and email service in DSTAR available to our users here. This is a keyboard and video display that we use for local administrative functions for the system. We do things here like administering local users, taking a look at gateway synchronization. This is a list of all the gateways on the system, the ones that have synchronized, the ones that have not recently. Everything we can do here, we can do remotely. Now that we've been properly introduced to a D-Star repeater, you've been hearing that term gateway over and over. Explaining that will lead us into a deeper discussion of D-Star. But first, I want to point out something you've already seen, that operating D-Star through a local repeater or simplex is pretty much like operating FM. You push to talk, let go to listen. The call sign you needed is Golf Bravo 7 Delta Sierra, and they are live now. Oh, beautiful. I know you get your hands full. Uh, David sent me an email this morning. Oh, and if you're wondering what this ULCL is all about, it's the alphanumeric display showing what Fred programmed into his radio instead of showing the repeater's frequency. I'm going to guess that it stands for UHF local, and the simple explanation for that is, well, there is no simple explanation. The UHF means that the radio is set for the K5TIT UHF repeater on 442.0 MHz. That's simple enough. But the LCL? Well, that means that the radio is routed for local operation. And now it's time to explain the gateway, the internet connection, and what you have to do with a D-Star radio to be part of it all. We do have worldwide networking. We can talk to users around the world. We currently have people online in Darwin, Australia, all over the United States and the United Kingdom. The uh, ki 4 PPF repeater is connected to the Internet Gateway and it's a lot of fun to work uh, other states via the Internet. Basically, if uh, you see a repeater and they've got a gateway up, uh, you can route audio and talk wherever you want to. CQ Dallas, CQ Dallas, N7MK, Phoenix, Arizona, anybody copy? We're back in Dallas, back down on the street, and that's Mark Kratz, N7MK, in Phoenix on the radio, talking to Fred. Well, this is great. I mean, you guys, you guys sound just like, you know, any of the users locally here do. Can't, can't tell any difference. Some of you might be thinking, that's nice, but ham radio through the internet is no big deal. We've been doing that for years with IRLP and Echolink. And for the benefit of those of you who are not familiar with those terms, I'll explain that IRLP, that's the Internet Radio Linking Project, and Echolink are both systems for linking repeaters worldwide by sending audio over the Internet using VOIP, that's Voice Over Internet Protocol. Both are very popular with thousands of participating repeaters and tens of thousands of hams. Each of those repeaters has a node number, and if you want to talk to someone on a distant repeater, you use your touch tone pad to send that number to your local repeater, and it makes the connection. D-Star is similar in that its audio travels over the internet as data, 
but the way you make connections is completely different, and it has a few unique capabilities that I'll get to in a minute. D-Star routes your signal by using call signs that are actually programmed into your radio using the on-screen menus. There are four key call signs. There's My Call, that would be KN4AQ down there on the bottom, and yes, the system wants to know who I am in a friendly big brother kind of way. I can add a few extra characters to further identify myself, so I've put HT after the slash to show that I'm using my handy talkie. That information will show up scrolling across the display of the receiving station. Echo Link doesn't do that. Next, there's your call. That's whoever it is I want to talk to. Most of the time, that's just programmed as CQ, CQ, CQ when I want to talk to anyone. But it can also be the call of a specific ham, or it can be the call of a remote repeater. Next, there's repeater 1. That's the local repeater that you're going to talk through. In this case, it's the KI4WXS repeater in Charlotte. The B indicates that I'm talking through the UHF repeater. The 2 meter repeater would have a C, and the 1200 megahertz repeater would have an A. And the D-Star gurus very much want me to tell you that there are eight spaces in the call sign field, and that the A, B, or C, they call that the port letter, must be in the eighth or final position. And finally, there's repeater two. That is usually the call sign of your local gateway. So you see the G after the call, in the eighth position. This is the setup if I want to route my signal from Charlotte, my local repeater, through the Charlotte gateway, and come out on the K0MDG UHF repeater in St. Louis. You see slash K0MDG space B in the your field. The slash tells the system that the call sign following is a repeater call, so please route my signal to that repeater. There are several ways to configure these call signs, sometimes different ways to do the same thing, and new operators are usually a little confused by them until they experiment a bit. I'll show you one more that demonstrates a powerful feature of D-Star. Suppose I want to talk to Mel, K0PFX, the ham in St. Louis who did our HF demonstration. Yes, Mel does D-Star too. I could just use the setup that routes me to the St. Louis repeater, K0MDG. But Mel does a fair amount of traveling, and I don't know where he is. So instead, I put in his call sign, K0PFX, no slash, no port letter, and my local repeater checks a file that shows what D-Star repeater anywhere in the world Mel keyed up last, and it routes my signal to that repeater. And it does that instantly. And here's a key point to understand. D-Star routes signals on a transmission by transmission basis. Every time someone keys up a D-Star radio, the repeater examines the four call signs they've programmed into that radio and decides what to do with their signal. It doesn't link repeaters the way some of us are accustomed to. And that means that if you hear a call come in over the gateway on your local repeater, CQ Dallas, CQ Dallas, N7MK, Phoenix, Arizona, anybody copy? You can't just respond. You have to program your radio with the correct path to reply. Most D-Star radios have a way to do this by pushing one or two buttons that capture the incoming data and set up the return path for you. And now, I think we finally have enough background to fully understand this display. LCL, or local, means the call sign routing is set so the signal will only go through the local repeater, not the internet. It takes a minute or two to set up a route using your radio's menus. That's not something you want to do while driving. Fred Varian offers this advice. Since there are a lot of call signs you have to manipulate, you build that into your memory channels. So in fact, you don't have to manipulate the radio. Most of us, as we hear a new repeater in the country or around the world come on, we build a channel for that. As we have users we talk to on a regular basis, we build a memory channel for those users also. There is optional software available that makes it a lot easier to program lots of memory channels with all these parameters. Now all this may seem a little complicated, and I found out there is a short learning curve till you get the hang of it. But if you have a local D-Star repeater, you also have some local experts who will be glad to help you figure it out. Okay, as much as I've shown so far, I've only told half the D-Star story. What's the other half? D-Star has uh, two data modes, a low-speed data mode and a high-speed data mode. We can run 128 kilobaud on 1200 megahertz using the ID1 digital radio system. In fact, at the back of the radio there is an um, RJ45 and it is an Ethernet port. 
would connect directly into a laptop. You can actually, uh, you know, get on the internet through the uh, the data uh, device on 1.2 gigahertz, and uh, you can have a laptop in your car and just pull up a web page. Right. This is something that has gotten emergency communications managers excited: a relatively high-speed Ethernet-based data system, basically the internet or an intranet that works wirelessly for miles with no other supporting infrastructure. One of the first big tests came at the Marine Corps Marathon in Washington, D.C. in October 2006. Well, Ham Radio for over 20 years has been providing communication support for the medical aid stations um, to allow the doctors to understand what's going on on their race. This year, um, we're doing an operational test of the D-Star digital data motor, which is 128 kilobits per second over 1.2 gig radios. So we have two 1.2 gig channels up and we are basically providing Ethernet um, service to the seven aid stations out on the course. And that's to allow the hams at the aid stations to directly enter the um, runner information, the check-ins and check-outs of aid stations into the, the database that the um, Navy medical folks here use. This is the comms trailer. At the front end of the trailer, we've got a three-band antenna that is 1.2 gigs, 440 megahertz, and 144 megahertz. At the back corner here, we've got our FM voice radio antenna. So that's 440, 220, and 144. And the far antenna here is a, a dual band 1.2 gig 440. Here we are inside the comms trailer. We have two ICOM RP2Ds, so they're 1.2 gig 10 watt radios, um, 128 kilobit per second radios. And what we have here are the two operator positions that we're using to both control our gateway machine and talk to our operators out over the network. We have a chat server on our uh, gateway laptop that allows us to use um, chat across all the aid stations, um, simplifies our communications with the aid stations. At the aid stations, the amateurs there will have laptops. Those laptops will connect to the ICOM ID1 radios. We'll use an e the Ethernet connector and the USB connector on the radios to allow the laptop to control the radio and to get Ethernet service from our gateways that are here at Iwo Jima. For them, it'll look like a normal 10 megabit per second ethernet connection, even though the radio part of it is only 128 kilobits per second. At the aid stations, they'll use a browser to browse to the correct database and enter the information of, for the runners. We also do run packet radio for the 20 years. 1200 baud packet radio has been the baseline service this year, we also have 9,600 baud packet running. Um, those are the, the backups in case the ID1 test, um, we're not able to execute that over all of it. In addition to the data networks, we operate um, two race networks on two meters. Okay, how are we doing with those two runners down there? Is uh, EMS on the scene yet? Negative, I don't have anybody here yet. We operate an aid station voice network on uh, 440, and we have a talk around net an informal net for making sure all the, the data stuff is up and running. Yeah, we just entered our first uh, customer on the uh, uh, web form. Uh, let us know on that end how it looks. The traffic over the digital network is really the runner um, check-in information. Um, they're um, identifying the runner and the reason that they checked in and the results of, of having checked in when they check out. This is uh, aid station 8-9, uh, the alternate uh, main med for the Marine Corps Marathon uh, 2006. And uh, our antennas over here on the, uh, to your uh, left, uh, we have a, uh, a vertical, a dual band vertical that uh, Steve uh, KB2 CEV will be running uh, packet and uh, voice on. The, uh, the Loop Yagi you see uh, behind it is a uh, 1.2 gig uh, Loop Yagi from Directive Systems up in Maine. Uh, I'll be running the, uh, the D-Star 1.2 gig uh, radio on that uh, uh, antenna, and uh, uh, Steve will be running a uh, Kenwood TMD700A on, uh, on the vertical. 
we haven't done this before, and uh, our primary uh, uh, link has always been uh, packet on uh, uh, 1200 baud or 9600 baud. But if we can get this uh, to work, uh, then this is a 128 kilobit uh, uh, packet uh, network, and we'll be uh, uh, instead of using a uh, kind of a command line interface uh, through Telnet, we'll be actually uh, pulling up a uh, a web page in a web browser. Uh, we'll also be running a uh, IRC. Uh, a chat session on the side. There's plenty of bandwidth for that. We probably have uh, six or seven aid stations around the course that are uh, trying this as well. The problem is, as you can see behind me here, uh, Gary, we got this big wall here, which is I-395, and uh, that, that's blocking our uh, line of sight path to uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, 1.2 gig rate, uh, uh, the 1.2 gig band really likes a line of sight path. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm simulating it by reflecting off the, uh, the uh, motel uh, up here on the uh, hill, and hopefully uh, that will work as well. Ian had to solve a few problems with his reflection path, but by the time runners began filtering into the aid station, he was up and running and was able to enter and retrieve information from the command center database over the D-Star network using his laptop and a web browser. Worked, uh, worked as advertised. They could see it up on the hill. Uh, pretty easy. I think uh, we could write this one off as a success. Uh, uh, at some point, we're going to put Packet out of business here. Hmm. Does that bother Packet operator Steve Tedesco? KB2CEV. Uh, well, my business is, is supporting my customer, and whatever we need to do to support the customer is 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 what I would want to, to use. So we're still supporting the customer, so we're still in business. The 128K data system is only built into the ICOM ID1 radio, so it's only available on the 1200 megahertz band where there's plenty of room for its wide bandwidth signal. It's over 100 kilohertz wide. The VHF and UHF radios have a data system of their own. It's low speed, 1200 bits per second, the same as most current packet. Well, welcome to the fun. But it's always there, running it's along with every voice transmission. You need a computer, or at least a terminal, if anyone remembers what those are, plugged into your radio to use it. A few text messaging and emergency communications applications have been written for it already, with more sure to come. This data passes right through repeaters and gateway connections. We can send basically email slow speed type uh, communications, which is good in, in the emergency environment. If you wanted to send out weather bulletins, he did a copy and a paste on a weather bulletin and sent that to me. And it's a uh, computer to computer, if you will, in the background, even while we're doing digital audio uh, voice. Yeah, good morning to you. I'm going to wrap up the D-Star segment of the program with a few more quick notes. First is weak signal performance. The range is almost identical between the digital and analog repeaters. Digital gives you a little bit better range, a little bit wider range. What you're going to hear on D-Star is crystal clear reproduction of the voice with that D-Star temper to it out until the signal finally disappears. An analog signal will gradually get noisier and noisier and then fade away. The D-Star is uh, just full quieting all the way to the end of the, the coverage area and it just drops out. Watch the S-meter drop to zero as this signal remains what we call full quieting until it drops out. Sometimes, though, weak D-star signals don't just drop out. They begin to garble as the error correction system fights to put syllables back together and just can't make it. Some D-star users call this R2-D2. Next, D-Star has some GPS compatibility. The ICOM 2820 Dual Band Mobile and 92AD Handheld both have optional GPS receivers, and you can connect an external GPS to the other models. The 2820 and 92AD can graphically display the direction and distance to other D-Star radios that are sending position information, while the other radios can display coordinates. A program running on the Gateway computer relays these position reports to the APRS network. But let me point out that D-Star data is not compatible with packet, so D-Star can't be used directly on any packet or APRS network. Most of the radios, though, can be connected to an external TNC for standard analog packet operation if that's what you want to do. 
There's a lot more information about GPS for D-Star and, for that matter, everything else for D-Star on a rapidly growing number of websites. I'll start you off with three. ICOM's website, icomamerica.com, is a good place to start, not just for product information, but also for the forum section they've dedicated to DSTAR. The Texas Interconnect Team site, k5tit.org, also hosts forums with lots of help for new users and repeater owners. And this site, dstarusers.org, has lists and maps of all the DSTAR repeaters and instant lists of all the users who've keyed up a gateway-connected repeater on the worldwide network. These lists show that, while DSTAR hasn't caught up with IRLP and Echolink, the number of repeaters and users is growing quickly. One of the things that, that I thought was lacking from a lot of the Yahoo groups I saw is that even if they had a large membership, they didn't have a lot of information. A lot of things had to be asked over and over again. So one of the things that I did in my Yahoo group was to go out uh, looking for and collecting uh, information about all of the digital modes, HF, VHF, digital voice, data, and now I have dozens and dozens of files and links on this Yahoo group so that if somebody does want to get on and, and do it, either learn more about a digital mode that they, they haven't used before or learn more about mode they're already using, there's likely a link or a file that, that they can look at. One technical subject I haven't discussed yet is bandwidth. The D-Star digital voice signal is a lot narrower than the analog FM we use today, about 6.5 kilohertz for D-Star compared to 16 kilohertz for FM. That means more D-Star repeaters will fit in a given amount of spectrum, though there's a lot of debate about just how narrow a D-Star channel can actually be. The Utah VHF Society has a good discussion about that on their website, with lots of research and documentation. Their conclusions, 12 kHz minimum channels, are more conservative than some other repeater councils that are pushing 10 kHz, and a new digital commercial system, similar to D-Star, developed by ICOM and Kenwood, that recommends 7.5 kHz. Frequency coordination groups are working on integrating D-Star into their band plans, and it's important because in most areas of the country, there aren't many or any repeater channels left to coordinate, especially on two meters. It's been said we could put at least two repeaters in the same place we could put one analog channel, uh, perhaps even more, but, but I think uh, for right now we've, we've got some, uh, some techniques to where we could, in a few instances, with a proper separation, uh, be able to put these repeaters between 20 kilohertz channels uh, with at least a 50 mile separation is what we've suggested and experimented with, and so far that's working very well. Finally, everyone wonders when and if any other manufacturers are going to start making D-Star equipment. So far, ICOM is the only one, but anybody can. The only proprietary component is the AMBE or AMBE 2020 vocoder chip, and anyone, manufacturer or home brewer, can buy them. Of course, someone may announce a new product the day after this video is released, and if they did, you probably know about it. But as of now, I can report that there is a growing aftermarket in D-Star add-on products. One of them is the DV dongle. This device contains the AMBI 2020 vocoder. It plugs into a computer USB port and it allows you to use your computer to talk through D-Star repeaters over their gateways. The biggest complaint I've heard about D-Star is that AMBI vocoder. Some hams think that the JARL should have chosen something completely open source. A problem I expect we'll hear more of is this. When you listen to D-Star or any other digital mode on an analog receiver, you hear something like this. We've already had one complaint to the FCC from an analog repeater owner about interference from a digital co-channel neighbor about 100 miles away. Frequency coordinators would like to keep analog and digital totally separate, but that's not going to be possible for every repeater, especially on two meters. Moving on. D-Star does have some competition from outside the amateur community. Uh, so what you up to? Uh, just uh, doing a little demonstration here, making sure everything's uh, working in the digital side. I mentioned P25 earlier. It's also known as APCO25, the digital voice standard that's used for public safety, police, fire, and EMS. P25 has been around long enough that the first generation of equipment is being replaced. Trade-ins are showing up on the surplus market, and hams have been converting radios and repeaters to the ham bands. All the major manufacturers are making P25 equipment now, but it started here, in Chicago, at two-way giant Motorola, and most of the surplus equipment is Motorola. So to find out more, 
I visited Aaron Collins, N90ZB, at his home in suburban Chicago. Aaron is the frequency coordinator for the Illinois Repeater Association, and he put up the first P25 repeater in the Chicago area. It's a digital voice system. It is a way of encoding voice and sending it in a digital fashion over the air and decoding it at the other end where it plays back in something that resembles a human voice. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, a big improvement over uh, analog when you're in fringe areas, you know, still make it in full quieting in a fringe area, whereas in analog you're choppy and uh, you get the usual pops and clicks of uh, picket fencing, if that's what you want to call it. There are no uh, amateur commercial or amateur available P25 units yet. Uh, there is quite a bit of commercial equipment that's available. Uh, stuff has fallen out from the government sector and the public safety sectors, and there is quite a bit of it available on the used market, some of it quite cheaply. Uh, one can obtain a used government surplus radio for as little as $150 and get on the air. These radios were originally priced in the $1,000, $2,000 range, but uh, their losses are gained, so to speak, and the stuff is showing up all, all the time in the used market. They're cheap nowadays. Abco Phase 1 is pretty much what everybody's using nowadays. In the narrowband, the 12.5 kilohertz configuration, you only have one voice or one data channel. And now the new Phase 2 stuff is going to fit completely within 6.25 kilohertz channel, so it'll have an ultra, ultra narrow band mode that's similar to the D-STAR's new 6.25 kilohertz ultra narrow mode. It's on the verge of being implemented commercially if it hasn't already started to be, but there has not been any fallout into the used market of any of the phase two stuff yet. So phase two makes P25 sort of a question mark for hams. Still, some hams prefer using converted commercial equipment, sort of like we did back in the early days of FM, because that's all we had. A friend of mine loaned me this Johnson P25 Portable to try to spur my interest. It weighs about 50 pounds, and it's almost as big as my 1970s vintage Motorola HT220. This is my pride and joy back then. Well, the technology in here is advanced, but it's still pretty big and heavy compared to today's ham radio equipment. You know, I don't think I've mentioned that all the D-Star radios, and all the P25 radios for that matter, are dual mode. They work both analog and digital. All the P25 repeaters are dual mode too, but the D-Star repeaters are only digital. Which brings me to my final point. How worried should you be about your analog radios becoming obsolete? Are you going to see your local you know, club's repeater change overnight into an all digital system? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I mean, if you look at it, all of the repeaters on the air right now, almost Probably 99.9% .9 of them are analog FM. It's just like CW, uh, it's just like AM. FM repeaters will still be around for the long haul. We're repeater builders and we grew up with the FM and analog systems and it sounds great and it'll be there for a long time. I don't see it just replacing analog in any sense. I think the two technologies will coexist for quite some time and will have advantages on each front. Digital won't replace analog anytime soon probably, but, it's, but it will be the wave of the future for amateur radio. Or as Kermit Carlson, W9XA, put it. Any similarity between this system and the field of dreams is not coincidental. We have built it and they have come. And that's it for another edition of Amateur Radio Video News. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Hey, this was fun. Let's do it again soon. <laughs> this was fun. Well, uh, they were right. It has not replaced uh, analog FM. Not yet. Probably not for a good long time. But we've got all those new modes. We've got uh, you know, DMR, which had, hadn't been developed as this program was, uh, was produced 10 years ago. Now it's around. C4FM, of course, was brand new. P25 uh, has turned out to have gone almost no place in amateur radio. There are some P25 repeaters, but they're not, in terms of qu a quantity of repeaters and the, and the number of hams using them, they're not up there in the, uh, uh, in the uh, you know, competitive arena with uh, D-Star, C4FM, and, uh, and DMR. All right, that is it. History on YouTube. <laughs> if you enjoy the, this ancient program, it would have cost you 25 bucks as a DVD. You just watched it for free. Unless you want to stop by hamradionow.tv and make a contribution, you can click on Arvin's icon and uh, 
um, and send us some money. And that is it for this episode of uh, History on Ham Radio Now, Digital Voice for Amateur Radio. I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. And even though I hadn't begun saying it on those programs, I will now. Over and out. <laughs>